he was writing the book at exactly the same time I was doing the cover. Uh, RL famously comes up with the title of the book first. So he would always give me the title and then he would give me, you know, if I was really lucky, I would get a paragraph. Usually I got a couple of sentences, maybe two paragraphs, but generally it was just real vague description of what the story was about. Now, as an artist, that's, that's the way I like it. If you gave me, if he was one book ahead all the time and I got a full book to read, I would read it and I'd be compelled and I'd be constricted by all the details that I read in the story. Movies on video cassette. Welcome to Strange Glow Video. Guys, I'm eating junk and watching rubbish. We're oozing with VHS, horror, nostalgia, and more. New better block glow in the dark. After it comes in videotape, you can get a glow in the dark hand puppet from the movie Casper. And now, your hosts, Alec, Justin, and Nick. Hey, you're not allowed to rent here anymore. Yeah! Hello, welcome back to Strange Glow Video. My name is Justin. And I'm Alec. And tonight we have a special guest with us, Tim Jacobus. Is that correct? That's correct. Perfect. How you guys doing? We are awesome. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. So uh, if you're not familiar with Tim's work, Tim is the artist behind so many of those iconic Goosebumps uh, books, those book covers, right? So I know a lot of you have the nostalgic ties to those. I know I certainly do. I used to read a ton of those and going through your website earlier and like looking at all the art prints you have available really was hit me in the nostalgia vibes of, Oh, I remember where I was at when I read that book. Right. It brought back not just pleasant memories of childhood, but pleasant memories of where I was at in the moment on some of those books. So. Yeah. If you're of a certain age, you couldn't escape uh, the goosebumps books. They were being pumped into your schools and they were everywhere for, uh, you know, for the nineties. So if you guys look like your prime time, so yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, it, we occupy a part of your brain. Yep. Special place for a lot of us. And I mean, I, I really think too, though, that seeing art like that exposes kids to art in ways that they may not otherwise be, you know, exposed to it. And so hopefully that created a lot of people that are in the art field now, just being inspired by your work. So any stories of anyone that's like approached you and told you that like you were the reason they went into the business? Uh, yeah, I've heard uh, everything from, you know, they were inspired to write some you know again a, a, a lot of uh people say it started out that they were copying my covers when they were a kid and then have since gone on to become you know graphic artists and and yeah it's a, a, a it's it's funny it's you would think that would be something i would have thought about prior to it but i didn't i was just concerned with making book covers and doing a good job at making book covers, hoping I could get more. And the idea that we got onto something that became popular, and now here we are 30 years later, and we're still talking about it, and people are saying that it influenced, uh, you know, stuff that they do now. That's that's kind of incredible. Well, Absolutely. yeah, here's, here's what I wanted to talk about, too, is that it actually – your artwork transcended just the books and not only is it like on the VHSs too but it like influenced what you actually see in them like how they made the monsters look and stuff you know it's not always 100% or anything but it definitely heavily influenced it and you can still see it on like the new goosebumps show that's on uh Disney plus yeah like in just I, the promotional I, artwork yeah i've only yeah i've only seen the trailer for that i haven't seen any of the the uh the actual episodes but yeah that's looking pretty good so yeah we'll see how far they lean into into my artwork but when they first did the well it started with the tv show and with the tv show they had a really limited budget so i would tune in just like you guys did to see how they were going to adapt my book cover to the tv show sometimes they were you know they were right on you know they yeah. it worked out spot on and then there were other times where they had to rewrite the story and change the artwork of, you know 100 percent to be able to to pull it off yeah. uh then the movies came out with jack black and that was really the first time where i went oh the abominable snowman yeah that would be what he looks like if he started moving around 
So, <laughs> yeah, uh, again, never gave any thought. Always thought that the art would only be 2D and that the images were only supposed to be 2D. And then to see them come to life and move, uh, that was a blast. Yeah, yeah that's it's really, awesome. It's really like just a testament to how I feel like your name should be a little more well known along. I mean, you know, R.L. Stein, we get it. He wrote them, but come on, give, give me a little. I couldn't even find your name in some of these books. I was looking and I was like, well, what the hell? So, well, OK, so there's a there's two things there. First off, Scholastic, uh, the book publisher, started out in the business as an ap academic uh, book publisher. They didn't do anything that was commercial or, or you know, math books, history books, geography books. And as a policy, they, you know, the covers were just the covers. They didn't commission them. They were pretty straightforward. So they just didn't get into the habit of putting the, the illustrator's name on the books. And then as the book started to evolve, they still kind of did the same thing. So when I came along, they still weren't putting my name inside on the title page. Uh, by the time we got to the uh, the series 2000, they were putting my name in the book. And from there on, you know, everybody who works for them now, they get their name in the book. I was just, I was just there a little too early. The other thing is those, the original art were uh, traditional pieces of art and they were 20 inch by 20 inch illustrations. So I did sign them, but I signed them, you know, in a, a two inch spot. But once you reduce it to fit on the book cover, you know, there's my name. It's fine when it's 20 by 20, right? It's there. I can yeah. see it on this one. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, yeah, there's some, well then to make it, to make matters even crazier, you guys, you know, I used to get letters from you guys when you were kids saying, oh, that's really cool how you hide your name in the covers. And I wasn't really hiding them. So then I went, OK, let's start hiding my name. And hmm. for the next six or eight books, I started hiding my name and I got so good at hiding them. You could never see it. And then I'm going, <laughs> what am I doing? No one's ever going to know I'm <laughs> my name. They're not going to know I'm doing the art. So then I just went back to just signing it in the usually in the lower right hand corner that's still um, a pretty fun story though to have like you hiding that in there and <laughs> you know putting that out there is kind of like your own like little where's waldo in, in the book exactly. covers themselves exactly i have i'm nearing completion of the original collection uh it's hard i always yeah i just i pick them up at thrift stores mostly because they're a lot cheaper that way and sometimes i pick up duplicates and hand them off to other people i i don't know if i'm speaking out of turn here i believe this is Justin's favorite. Am I correct? Uh, there's a lot, but there's a few that really had nostalgia ties to me. Um, one of my favorite covers, though, was the Werewolf of Fever Swamp. And it just, yeah, yeah. it's just so iconic to like think about. I mean, when I see that cover, I just think I was at my grandma's house. I went to stay with her in the summer and I got to go stay. And so she took me to the bookstore and I picked out three or four books. And that was the first one I read. So I remember being in her guest room on the bed reading that book. And every time I see that cover, like takes me to that spot. And so that's one that really stands out with me through, through time. Yeah. Yeah. I like the colors on that one that, you know, the, the purples and the greens really make that pop out. Oh, it's beautiful. I, uh, I think for me, it's probably welcome to horror land. That's yeah. Definitely I'm a horror, one. horror land fan myself. So yeah, that's I'm definitely. A... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it was, uh, the the premise was good. I like that there's some there's some nice depth in that piece where you know the sign is in the foreground. Uh, you can't tell if the monster is part of the sign or if he's you know coming to life and grabbing a hoe over the sign. And then you can see that you know that nasty looking carnival in the background, and uh, you wonder what's going on back there. So yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. So iconic. How did you get the Goosebumps gig, right? I mean, was there a traditional process of like, hey, we're, we're hiring for this role? And, you know, did you submit a traditional portfolio for that? Or did you have a piece that you just thought really fit the series when you got word of it? No. So um, we all, so we illustrators back then all had our portfolios and we would walk around uh, Manhattan and go to all the publishers 
and you would submit your portfolio and eventually you were able to get some work and once you got in with a place and you started to be consistent and uh you know you, you weren't a flake you got your work done on time your work always was at a specific level you would continually get work so i had been working with scholastic a couple of years i didn't do any series work but i had done I don't know, a half a dozen books for them, eight books, and uh, not nothing horror. I was doing some kid stuff. Actually, a majority of it was kid stuff. And when Goosebumps came along, I had just finished something up, so I wasn't busy. Um, it's really no more than that. You know, it was kind of standing in the right place at the right time. If I was on another project, it was just going to go to the next guy, uh, you know, standing next to me. So um, there was an element of luck to it. And uh, a big, back then, no social media. So I didn't even know who R.L. Stein was. I mean, I kind of heard of him, but it didn't mean anything to me. And uh, the publishers were real, uh, real iffy about Goosebumps being successful. They thought it was not going to work. They, you know, they, no one had ever tried horror for kids seven to 11. Their, you know, their instinct was this is really isn't going to be anything. And they came to me and they said, listen, Tim, uh, we've got this new series. We think you'll fit, be a good fit for it. We don't think it's going anywhere. And we're going to pay you a little bit less to do the covers on these. Uh, we understand if you don't want to do it. But, uh, you know, if you if you do this and it doesn't go anywhere, we'll put you on to something else. And, uh, you know, you don't want to work for less. But I, I read through the first. Uh, so the first one was Welcome to Dead House. And RL had already written a full chapter. So I read the first chapter to it and I went, oh, this is kind of cool. Sure. I, I don't care. I, you know, I'll make a little less money, but I'm now, don't get me wrong, they were still paying me. It just right. wasn't full price. And I was like, yeah, now these will be fun. I'll definitely do this. And uh, did the first one. And uh, Goosebumps didn't, like, get out of the launch pad right away being, you know, uh, gangbusters. And, you know, maybe, you know, we were six books in. And there was some talk of maybe not you know, maybe canceling it. <clears throat> but then somewhere around book nine, book 10, you guys, you know, and everything was word of mouth back then, you know, started to pass the word and it really started to get some momentum. And it, the sales went from being just flat and adequate to, you know, straight up. And uh, from then on, it was the book a month and RL and I did a book a month for the next 10 years. That's incredible. Yeah. So I, I noticed that you said, because I was going to ask you about the size of the original pieces. So you said 20 by 20. What yes. kind of mediums were you working in for that then? So digital art was not something that, you know, Joe artist at home could do back then. You know, you had yeah. to work for a big company and it was rare. And uh, so I was doing uh, acrylic paintings. Like I said, 20 by 20. And it was a combination of brush and airbrush. Uh, airbrush gives it that slick, smooth, polished look. I, before I got into the book business, I was actually painting, you know, I painted cars, you know, murals on vans. It was the seventies, uh, motorcycle tanks. And, uh, I had used the airbrush for that. And then when I went to art school, I had, you know, learned how to use the airbrush, you know, pretty proficiently. And I started to include it in some of my regular uh, school projects. By the time I got out of art school, I had really figured out a, a way to make that work real well with the acrylic paints. And uh, so that's kind of where the, the style came from. Um, the, the world all did finally go digital. But what was to my advantage, if you really look at those pieces, they kind of have a digital look, even though they're, it wasn't digital. So when digital came along, I was able to recreate that style 
uh, in the digital world. But yeah, everything was hand painted. Uh, I packed them up in cardboard and I shipped them out Federal Express. And uh, yeah, and so uh, yeah, somewhere in a warehouse at Scholastic are uh, a lot of very, very cool paintings that uh, uh, are just hanging there. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Glad to hear that. And I did read on your site that you have switched to an all digital workflow. So that's pretty cool. Do you, and I, but you're offering sketches, so you're obviously still yeah, working it's so, in both it, styles. Yeah, it, it, that's, you know, I, I, I say I'm digital because that's anybody who's doing production work. That's what they want to hear. Mm -hmm, Everything sure. that I do still starts on my desk right here with a pencil and a piece of paper. And I draw and sketch traditionally old school. I get my sketches nice and tight, and then I'll scan them into the computer and all the color work gets done there. So it still has that traditional feel. And the only thing that's being done digitally is the color work. So, you know, I don't spill paint anymore. That's really the only difference between the old way and the new way. Yeah, but that's that's awesome though, because I think a lot of people forget that you could do a hybrid model, right? That works very well for a yeah, lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you got whole generations of artists now too that have only really done it in a digital medium so being able to carry yourself back and forth i think really lends yourself some artistic creativity to be doing sketches and things like that when you're out at events or cons or fundraisers or things like that where you might be out there doing stuff so yeah absolutely and uh I, again that's how i learned so it, it you it, it you can't unlearn stuff so sketching uh pencil work, painting. I did that for 20 plus years before digital even came along. So I still have that skill set. So it's good to, to incorporate it and break it out whenever it's possible. Um, you know, the nice thing about digital is, you know, you've got, you can make corrections real easy. And if, you know, you guys are there in Kansas City and you hired me to do the job I could shoot it over to you right now. We could have a phone call like this, a Zoom call. You could look at it and go, gee, hey, can you make the background a little more blue? I've got that blue on another layer. We could in real time adjust it where back in the old days, if you said, hey, can you make that background a little more blue? I'd go, sure can. I'll see you in two days. And I would go and paint it. So it's really move stuff along uh, uh, real efficiently when it comes to something that's, uh, you know, for a commercial job. Now, if you hire me and you say, hey, I, all I'm gonna do with this is hanging on the wall in my living room, I'll go old school again. And I'll give you, you know, I'll paint with the airbrush and, and the paints and I'll hand you something tactile that you can hold in your hand and hang on the wall. And, uh, uh, you know, because, uh, nobody no printer knows what to do with a uh, with a painting anymore they like digital files yeah they don't know how to adapt that and that was a that used to be an art of itself was you know making that something that was able to be printed out onto a book cover right yeah there was yeah it was uh, there was such a routine to it that there was actually a woman uh in manhattan that all of the illustrators went to so that she would make the first photographic reproduction that was going to go to the publishers that they could then do the color separations off. And she had this incredible camera and all these lights and my work's really nice and flat. So there wasn't a lot she had to do with my stuff, but I saw her do amazing lighting with, you know, oil paintings that have raised surfaces and mm -hmm. she got that yeah. stuff to be so perfectly flat and no reflections in the corners and, uh, so yeah, that was a whole, you know, that was a, a whole job for some person and you know, now that job doesn't, doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. That's, that's pretty incredible to see that. So I've, I, you know, looking at your artwork, I definitely see a surrealistic <laughs> surrealism influence, right? So you see some of that Salvador Dali, like style yeah. of the smooth textures and some of those weird warp textures and. I'm just curious, like, what artists inspired you to get into art when you started out? Um, there was a uh, an illustrator named Roger Dean, and he, uh, you know, albums were where I really learned out learned who the the illustrators were back in again 
I went to high school in the in the seventies, late seventies. Went to art school in the early eighties. Album covers were that was the you know that was the gallery of the day. That's where you found out where the really cool illustrators were. And there was this guy Roger Dean who did a bunch of album covers for the band Yes. And uh, I was a fan of the music, and I became a real fan of this guy's stuff. And then I started to get books that he had put out about his work. And it, his work has a real surreal feel to it. And he was the first one that, you know, I was in art school by then. And, you know, I was doing, you know, I could draw what I could see. And uh, he was the first guy to get me to start thinking past that and, you know, draw what you, you know, that no one can see other than in your own head. and. Uh, you know, conjure up stuff that, you know, if you want, you know, people can go outside and take a picture if you want to just make a tree. But if you want to make a tree that's, you know, half alien, then do that yourself. And it really got me to kind of think out of the box. But, uh, you know, his use of color and just his way of, uh, you know, opening my my thought process. He was a big influence. That's awesome to hear. I mean, we're both musicians ourselves too, so can definitely uh, admire and respect the fact that the uh, album covers really had that influence on you. Because I mean, when you look at it, a twelve by twelve vinyl record, Boy. right? And and vinyl's having its renaissance now. There's nothing quite like that tangible object in your hand to just go over all the details and really admire every little bit of work that went into that i think that's really awesome to hear that that's what influenced you because i think yeah because we used to sit there for hours and you know you, like you said the 12 by 12 you'd open it up there'd be all the liner notes you would read all that i mean again no social media so you found out about the band through the, the you know through the album covers themselves so not only were they a you know a, a beautiful art graphic but they were also uh you know a source of information and like you say, that it's so cool that vinyl has made a real uh, comeback. I've actually done more uh, album covers now than I did back when vinyl was king. So, um, yeah, I like it. it. It's really cool that everybody uh, still is enjoying vinyl. Yeah, I saw the uh, art you did for the uh, Goosebumps was that the film's uh, score? Soundtrack, yeah, yeah. Yeah, soundtrack, yeah. And so that that was pretty cool to see you go back to that classic style. I like I like when they're not afraid to go and do that throwback style for something, right? That, you know, the movie style is a little bit different on its own, but it's like, right. hey, let's let's really honor where this is coming from and kind of do that. So I was, I was happy to see that when I was looking through everything you've done recently. Yeah, I was happy that I got the call for that. And uh, uh, the when the movie came out the first one uh you know i was hoping maybe i could do something for it it'd been years and years since i had done anything goosebumps related and um you know rl was telling me that you know he had shot his part and you know that they were the movie was moving along and then i started to hear about its release date which was uh in october of whatever year that was and uh you know, I, nobody had reached out to me for anything. And I was like, ah, I get it. You know, I'm the book guy, but would have been fun. And uh, I get a phone call late in August saying, hey, you know, at the end of the movie, um, the way the movie ends, Jack Black walks up to the glass case. He sees the invisible boy typing. He turns to the camera, he screams, and he morphs onto a Goosebumps cover. And the movie ends. And they were trying to recreate the Goosebumps cover, and it wasn't working right. And they went, well, why don't we just call the guy who makes Goosebumps covers and let him paint this? So yeah. I was able to do the artwork for that. So at the end of the movie, it's only on the screen for about two seconds, but I got some art in there. So that was a, that was a, a, that was a nice addition for me. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to honor you there. I mean, really, imagine how many artists that worked on that film that you inspired Right. Yeah, I, mean, I think and, and yeah, the guys who did all the credits, they also did some uh did some cool work with some of the artwork and they were able to take my art, the actual art, scan it and then do some like uh, simple animations with it where, you know, uh the shocker on Shock Street um 
praying mantis moved the you know uh the abominable snowman my painting and this is all happening while the credits are rolling and he's shaking the the lamp post and uh yeah it was uh the the guys who worked on it were you know same age as you guys and uh they were saying yeah you know as a kid this was a big deal and this was a lot of fun to do this and uh yeah it was fun for me too that's awesome you know you did such a great job with the colors right and it, you know someone that has i have a little bit of an art background myself and so you know taking art history and some graphic design courses and stuff early on when i was younger and the colors you know you say they're subjective right everyone's going to have those different responses but the colors you have on there just pop but you have such this complexity with uh the light and the contrast on there like they all just stick out so well and they all translate so well to a book cover was that very intentional or thought out of how to like make those pop that way knowing that they'd be reproduced on a book cover well thanks i mean yeah that was a 100 percent intentional so excuse me like i said there was this this undercurrent of fear that uh the goosebumps were going to be too scary uh actually uh i did book number one welcome to dead house and a different illustrator did book number two stay out of the basement uh guy's name was jim Thiessen, uh super illustrator had a horror background and um uh, they said, yeah, you do the, he'll do one, you do one, and then we'll just see what they look like. We're going to print it out and do the whole thing, and uh, we'll see how they will look. And when they got done, they put them side by side, and they go, yeah, these, you know, these are both very nice, but uh, I like Tim's use of color. Those saturated colors make these pieces less scary. And so when I heard I got the gig because of my color work, then I went, all right, well, that's going to be our thing then. Uh, we're going to make these real rich in color. And uh, uh, again, I took every every color theory lesson that I learned at art school and, and put it to play and really made a conscious effort not to repeat at the same color combination any time uh, for the pieces. And the guys who were then subsequently putting the books back to you know doing the actual book design mm -hmm. were then leaning into it so all the covers had a different color to them the goosebumps logo was a different color and they were always pulling colors out of my my painting to accentuate yeah perfect example right there this great example i was thinking just because it, the the they colors, like the you said, pulled right, right out of there. They pulled the, pink, they pulled the blue, and, and they did it every time. And again, so every book was a, a mini art piece to itself. So, you know, uh, they were all standalones. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was, like I said, totally conscious. I was trying <laughs> I was trying real hard to make the colors work. Yeah, and I, I think they did a great job with the book design because you know you stand them on a shelf and looking at the spines they all look great you know they number up but they're fun to look at because it's not like a volume of encyclopedias where they're uniform they're uniform with the text and everything but the colors are really just make that so fun to look at and then this the sheer joy you get from pulling one of those out from a bookshelf just to see the the cover right and just to be surprised by it if you're not familiar with it i think that really goes a long yeah, way and, and what was super super unique is 97% of the time that you're on a series, it's always, you're painting, always painting the same thing. If you're on the Harry Potter series, <laughs> you're always painting Harry Potter and, you know, and his friends in the castle and this, but it's always that same thing. Every Goosebumps book, R.L. Stein was reinventing the wheel and we had a new set of kids, a new monster, a new location. Everything was new every time. So like you say, you could go up to the your shelf of books and pull one out and you could be, you know, it could be anything going on on that cover. Yeah, it's kind of just the nice surprise of that. And then obviously Scholastic knew what they're doing because all the book fairs they had, you know, they'd get those out there and line them up and they really... I mean, it really just made it a unique series that how could a kid not be drawn to go look at those, right? Because they're just scary enough to 
make you go look at it. Unlike the horror section of like going to a video store back then, it's around the same time, right? <laughs> this is a lot more approachable, but it has that same vibe of like, ooh, where do you, where do you, where do you start? What do you pick? Yeah, and again, that that whole system was already in place because Scholastic was an academic book publisher. They already had the inroads to the schools. I don't know who invented the the Scholastic Book Fair, but it was genius. Yeah. And, you know, and then once we got into that pipeline, you couldn't, like I said, you guys couldn't escape a Goosebumps book if you wanted to. So one question I have is around working with RL. So, you know, you said for the first cover you did, you read the first chapter. How much how much of the story did you usually get before you kind of went to concept with your with your part of the work? Uh, next to nothing. Uh, he was writing the book at exactly the same time I was doing the cover. Uh, R.L. famously comes up with the title of the book first. So he would always give me the title and then he would give me, you know, if I was really lucky, I would get a paragraph. Usually I got a couple of sentences, maybe two paragraphs, but generally it was just real vague description of what the story was about. Now, as an artist, that's, that's the way I like it. If you gave me, if he was one book ahead all the time and I got a full book to read, I would read it and I'd be compelled and I'd be constricted by all the details that I read in the story. So by me not getting those details, I got to make them up. So it kind of freed my whole imagination to go, all right, I know as little about this book as the kid who's going to pick it up when, you know, when the cover's done. And so I'm going to just make it as crazy as I can and as interesting as I can. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that was a, that to me, that was an advantage. Yeah. That, and I think it, it really pays out that way hearing that because it makes sense because, you know, it, it's not directly always a, an exact match of what you may have read in there, but it, it sells you on the story. It sells you to read this story, right? You know, they say right. don't judge a book by its cover, but in this case, the the cover is what sells these stories for you, right? As a youngster, right? You may have $10 for that. So which one are you going to pick? Well, the art that calls to you the most is probably the one you're going to pick up next. So I think that makes it easy for a kid to, to choose that. You know, obviously, I think the don't judge a book by its cover really works more for a experienced adult reader more than anyone else, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were, I was hoping you were judging the books by the covers, uh, you know, as a kid, you know, all I wanted you to do is pick it up. If I could get you to touch it, I win. Uh, you, you take it home and read it, then it's RL's deal. You know, he's got to keep you hooked. And the other thing is every RL Stein books ha has that surprise ending or twist or something. I never knew what they were. So I could never give away that trick ending because it didn't exist yet while I was doing the cover. So again, I never tipped the hand or, you know, gave away anything that, uh, so you guys were always surprised when the ending happened. Yeah, that's great. So I see that you've, you know, you've done some other properties. That's why you did a number of, uh, Star Trek covers. You got to yep. do a Stephen King cover. Is there any like IP or property or line that you haven't done that like is a, a dream project for you at this point? You know, I've, I've been, you know, I, I, it, it all sounds corny, but I've been so lucky to be on popular stuff. I've been busy. You know, I did my first cover in probably, you know, 1985, and I've been doing covers and art ever since. So I've been doing it for years and years and years. I've always stayed busy. Um, what's nice is, uh, you know, we're, we're now in a kind of a renaissance period where you guys are grown up and you do cool stuff like have podcasts or you're in bands or you're art directors or you make skis or you do all kinds of wild stuff and you send me emails and say, hey, I was a Goosebumps fan when I was a kid. I got this project. I want you to do goosebump style artwork on my album cover or skis or whatever. So, um, you know, it's come full circle where my, you know, my old bands are now my new employers. Yeah. You definitely uh, got me considering recording an album just so I can have you do the artwork. 
<laughs> I've I've put out a number of solo albums already. So I worked with a couple of labels a year, a couple, you know, like 10 years ago. I was really heavy into it, mostly just online stuff, but you got me considering it. <laughs> there you go, right. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I I always liked uh, I have if you rummage through my site and look at some of my older stuff, I have a lot of stuff that doesn't look like goosebumps. Uh, it's really great that um, the goosebumps stuff is the thing that became very popular. I really like the style. I, you know, I like the, I like everything about it. Like you said, there's the colors, there's the warp perspective. Um, there's the, you know, there's a, a lightness to it they're horror but you know there's times where it's almost comical what's going on in there yeah so i like that that's the thing that caught on and uh i'm not um i have some other pieces that are more um uh, less i don't know how to say it less cartoonish so more realistic and whenever you do more realistic you got to lean into it more it's a lot more effort so uh, the fact that the the lighter, more fun stuff is what got popular. That's, you know, that's a blessing. Yeah. On average, how long would it take you to do like the, uh, the, the, a cover from start to finish? Uh, back in the day, I had to do them in a week, you know? Okay. Uh, so uh, I had to do a goosebumps a month. I was also working for other publishers at the time. So yeah, about four paintings were coming out of it here a month. Uh, now I do a, a lot of different stuff. I'm an art director at a small studio. Uh, I do, you know, I do some corporate stuff, but there's always an illustration going on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have three that need to be done, uh, by the end of, uh, October and, uh, for, a, you know, for a card company, I can't say any more than that. And, uh, so there's always illustrations still going now. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's still it's still fun you know that's uh, that's the part that i really <laughs> if you had asked me in 1985 if in 2023 after i'd done hundreds of these things would it still be fun i don't know if i would have told you yeah because boy back then when you start and, and you guys you know you're a musician you guys are creative when you first start doing something it's a grind it's so hard you know, it's it. Everything is an effort, and then as after you do it hundreds of times, it gets it just gets easier because you've already run into those problems. Nothing, you know, everything becomes a little more fluid. You don't freak out as much. Um, you don't wreck stuff. You know, it it becomes a it, it becomes a, 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 it becomes fluid. Yeah, I. I, I... Totally agree with that, right? The more you do it, but it's awesome to hear that you're still enjoying it and having fun with it because I think there's a lot of people that go into a career choice that, you know, they they kind of get that burnout for a while and yeah. it, it kind of becomes less fun. And the fact that you're able to stay creative in a creative job that, you know, I mean, illustrations, right? There's always that line of, I think as an, as an artist, you're always like, am I doing what I want to do or am I doing what someone else wants to do? And I think, I think you really had at least to me, looking at those Goosebumps covers, it looks like you're doing a combination of both, right? You're able to put what you wanted into it while also doing doing the work to can, you know, kind of keep your, your career on track. So I think that's pretty pretty special and unique. I don't think everyone gets to do that. That's a, that's a real good point because as an illustrator, that's your job. Your job is to do someone else's ideas and do them as best as you can, convey what they're trying to get out there you know of course you're adding your flair to it but again it's someone else's ideas and you're exactly right the goosebumps so here's how the thing this is why i think i got lucky and and there became something a little bit special about the goosebumps stuff because nobody was thinking this is going to be super, super successful. Everybody's thinking this is kind of a stinker. So when it starts, 
nobody's really paying attention to what we're doing. You know, they got other projects they're working on that they think are going to be the big successful ones. So they let, just kind of let me do my thing. Then, so we've got, you know, nine or 10 under our belt before Goosebumps really takes off. And when it takes off, somebody up top, whoever they were, I don't know, was smart enough to say, this thing is working. Don't anybody mess with this. Don't change anything. And everybody just keep doing what they're doing. And again, I just kind of got to do my thing. And that's not typical at all in the, in the book business. Heck, it's not typical in any business. There's usually, you know, there's usually eight people who want to make sure they're getting their two cents worth. Absolutely. So one other thing I wanted to bring up and talk about was, you know, your website is jacobastudios.com and you have prints for sale on there. You also have some hand-drawn sketches on there. But one of the things that immediately stood out to me was the fact that you give back $10 from everything you sell on that website to help feed the local uh, local community through the food pantry out there. And I think that's just incredible. Um, you don't see a lot of people doing that at a smaller scale like that, right? I think you see a lot of big companies trying to put on big fun fundraisers to, to do that, but just to see an artist that's taking care of his community simply because you can simply because it, it's the right thing to do. I think that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. And, you know, like I said, that stood out immediately upon seeing that. So what kind of inspired you to, to start with your philanthropy there? So it started during the pandemic and, you know, we all right at the beginning, everybody goes, uh Oh, you know, how is this going to affect, you know, you know, we all go self-centered at the beginning it's like how's this going to affect me and luckily you know it, yes businesses shut down but we were able to stay relatively busy busier than most people so you know we dodged that first bullet and then as you're you know sitting around and you start watching tv and you see all these people that are you know lining up and going to food banks and the thing that caught my attention was it was a news report and the newscaster, you know, is talking to the, the, the woman in the car and she's going, look, you know, I had to come down here. I, you know, I, I need to use the food bank. She goes, I've never had to do this before in my life. This is the first time. And when the, you know, the reporter finished his thing, he said, that's not the first time I heard that story today. And I went, well, you know, if we, you know, start making these Goosebumps posters and we can get some food together, I have a, my son lives with me, he's 24 and I'm going, well, if the two of us work together, we can, we can do something, you know, like you say, small scale, but what's good about it is I, I can guarantee you that the $10 from your poster, a hundred percent of that goes to buying food. It's just me and him. We order the food from Walmart. They deliver it to the house. We load it in the truck and we drive it down the street to the food bank and we load it into their, uh, into their, into their closets. So there's nobody else involved. There's no administrative costs. There's no anything. So a hundred percent of your 10 bucks goes in there. And when it started, you know, it was we were, you know, it was quaint. We went over there with a couple bags full, you know, and, but it was a start. And now uh, we fill the back of a, the my pickup truck and we have to fill the seats, the back seat. And uh, so we're taking a, a huge amount of food over. Now the the pantry is depending on us to, to keep showing up with uh, with the food. So uh they know us now they for the longest time they thought that uh we worked for walmart so they kept calling us the walmart guys and then finally we explained that it's really the goosebumps fans that are supporting this thing and there are older women who work there and they remembered buying the, the books for their kids. So now we're all on board with what's going on there. So they know that it's the Goosebumps fans that are, are helping to, to help the community. That's very awesome. I just think that's such a natural way to do something and to do good while also, you know, sharing the love out there, right? Everyone that's buying that like clearly is putting a unique piece of art in their house that 
really yeah. stands out to them and speaks to them. So I think, uh, you know, thank you for making that available for everybody and being thoughtful enough to put that back into your community there. I think, I think that was something that, you know, can be lost easily on people is, is giving back and helping out when they can. And the fact that you were thoughtful enough and took the time to do it, I think really speaks volumes to, to you so, as a like I said, creator. It started, yeah. It started, like I said, in that moment of watching that news report and now we've been doing it long enough to where, you know, it's we're uh we're over three years you know we've done 38 40 uh truckfuls over there and uh you know there's a you know uh, selfishly there's a good feeling that comes out of it for me and my son too so it's not a it's you you get more out of it than you know than what we give for sure absolutely well that's great to hear so are you guys have a busier time than others for for selling this or is this kind of an ongoing thing or it it goes no, I, I, it's funny it's a running joke with my son so he he pulls the orders every night uh writes them down goes upstairs we have a room that's just with posters all laid out he pulls the orders he puts them on the table and then the next morning when i get up i sign them all and package them all and then uh they go out and i'm you know to me it seems like it should just be you know it should be either incredibly erratic you know none this day then you know five the next day then none for two weeks and it's just every day it's you know it's consistent there's you know there's at least 10 orders every day uh i go i leave town and i do cons i was just away this weekend and one of the hardest things about it is so when i got back from the con my plane didn't get into one i didn't go to bed till three i gotta get up monday morning and hit it and when i get up there's you know there's 20 orders to sign and fill to, to start the day. And it's just like, uh, uh, you know, but I'm going, I can't believe this. I, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of people who still love this stuff. And I'm so surprised that consistently for years now, people have just buying them steadily. Well, and I think, you know, with the new series coming out, I think that's really going to just, keep that going right because you're reaching a whole new audience you've got the nostalgia vibe like i've got three kids myself and so my boys are old enough to read now so it's like a natural like hey here's some of the books i read as a kid and you kind of start passing that on to the next generation and those stories i think you know they're written so they're easy to for a young reader to enjoy and they're pretty much timeless in that regard right it's, it's something that's easy yeah. to pick up and get through and really get people hooked on reading so and it's great you know that again this multi-generational thing where you enjoyed them as a kid. And like you say, the the stories are kind of timeless. There's nothing in there where they, they're going to come back to you. And, you know, other than the fact that when the kid gets in the jam, he's not pulling out his cell phone to call his mom. Uh, you know, the stories are, are kind of timeless. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, that, that's cool to hear that your kids are reading. And you're out there doing cons and stuff. So, are you how often are you doing those and i know because you know we go to cons ourselves pretty regularly and i know how the, how busy that circuit can be if you're actually pretty active on it yeah it's something uh you have to you, you got to be smart about because you know it's uh it's real enticing to just go and go and go and then all of a sudden you're you know you're burning yourself out uh you know traveling can be hard and uh, like i said i didn't get in till three o'clock in the morning on sunday and uh but uh i try to do a little more than one a month so okay. yeah so you know this year i had a stretch in the, in the late spring early summer where i did four cons in six weeks that was too many you know that was yeah was tough you know as fast as i'm getting home i'm packing it back up and hopping on a plane or hopping in the car and driving somewhere so yeah if i can have a week 
you know, like skip a week. Yeah, I, I could probably do two a month if I could schedule it right. But I, I think I did 16 or 17 this year, maybe 18. So, uh, yeah, that's a lot, you know. I, it I mean, is, but I didn't just jump, you know, like the first year I did it, I think I did three. And then I went, okay, you know, and you got to figure out logistically all the stuff that you need to do and how to do it. And you get better. Every time you do it, you get a little better at the, the at the routine and what you need to do. And uh, yeah, it's, it's also really, really fun. Uh, you know, uh, this is a business where for years and now, you know, it's a, it's a solitary business. You just sit here and you create your art. And if you don't sit here, you're not creating anything. So you do it by yourself and you sit here. So it's really nice to hop on a plane, go to a city that you've never been to and meet people who are really enthusiastic about the art that you've created and, uh, you know, and have conversations that you would normally not have. Listen, I love my son. He's great, but he doesn't care less <laughs> about what I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, it always seems like the uh, the children of an artist are the, the ones least impressed by the artist. <laughs> I, I get <laughs> you it. Know? You know, I, was, yeah. I was totally unimpressed with my dad's stuff that he did. And, you know, it took until I was an adult, a, a, a older adult, where I went, oh, man, that was pretty cool, dude. So, yeah, getting yeah, to that's, see that's, that and make sense of it. Yeah, that's just, that's normal. Well, that's awesome. So uh, any final thoughts or anything there that you have upcoming that you want to announce or talk about? Um. I can't. Yeah, I'd love to tell you what these cards are. They're from a a big, uh, you know, a big producer. It's a name you know. Not allowed to tell you, and uh, they'll be coming out soon. Uh, I have uh, four pieces of art that should be released in the next, you know, uh, six to eight weeks that everybody will be able to see some new stuff. So that's always mm -hmm. fun. Uh, yeah, uh, new art is always uh, that, that's where it's at. Absolutely. It keeps you going. Uh, so if anyone wants to find you on social media, kind of get a tease of that when you're able to announce it, where should they find you? Yeah. Instagram's the best. And then just do Tim Jacobus at Instagram uh, on Instagram. Uh, uh, it, it Hashtag original goosebumps illustrator. If you can't spell Jacobus, nobody can. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm an easy find. I really am an easy find. Awesome. And what was that? We really... Oh, go uh, ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask the name of your uh, website one more time. It's jacobastudios.com. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. recommend everybody checking that out because, like I said, yeah. there's, there's signed yeah, there's, prints on there, and they are not expensive, people. They are very affordable. And as we were talking about, some of that goes to help a local food pantry. So win win for everybody. Yeah, win win win. win. There's four, and there's four new ones. So, uh, you know, we just went from 16 to 20. And uh, th there's got to be one in there you'll like. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate your time uh, chatting with us, Tim. And uh, make sure you go follow him online. You can find links to his website and Instagram here down in the uh, comments. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're on the audio feed, uh, just help yourself to your nearest web browser and uh, make sure you check it out. Support the, uh, the food bank drive by picking up a piece of signed artwork and, uh, you know, holidays are right around the corner. So now's a good time to start yeah. buying things and stuck stuck in it aside to uh, make sure that you can wrap it up and make sure Santa Claus delivers it on Christmas Day. Make you feel like a kid again. To return some videotapes. To return some videotapes.